In this news roundup of the week for Friday 22nd of March 2024, there's the promise of a nuclear power renewal in the United States this week as work finally begins on America's first fourth generation plant. The pilot project for highly controversial geoengineering has a rather important news update that it's announced. And Joe Biden brings in his slightly watered down but still pretty radical regulations to boost the uptake of electric vehicles. Now, a few years ago, I did a video about fourth generation nuclear power, why it was an emerging thing, how it might be expected to develop. A big part of the story was about various entrepreneurs collaborating, particularly with Chinese counterparts, because China was serious about expanding nuclear power and serious as well about experimenting with the next generation of technology. Well, then Donald Trump slapped a wave of tariffs onto China, slammed the door on tech collaborations, and that was that for a number of existing projects. I've wondered... A couple of times since then, how the US companies that were keen on this sort of innovation would eventually regroup. Well, this week it seems like we got at least part of an answer. The US firm TerraPower, which was co-founded by Bill Gates, is starting to build a new nuclear power plant in Wyoming next to a retiring coal power plant. This will be the Natrium Reactor, which is a small fourth-generation advanced reactor and storage system. The reactor design uses sodium as a coolant rather than water, making it more cost-effective in theory at least, and it uses molten salt for its energy storage system, which is supposed to offer clean, flexible and stable energy for the grid. Not only that, but it's expected to have an operational reactor by 2030, which is pretty short on the historical gestation period for nuclear power plants. It said that the aim would be to deploy another five similar reactors by 2035. The natrium reactor operates at a low internal pressure, which simplifies construction and reduces potential safety risks. It uses uranium fuel more efficiently than the old-style reactors. The company's chief executive, Chris Levesque, told the Financial Times that the reactor could be built for around half the cost of a standard water-cooled reactor. This is the first real expression of American firms seeking to catch up with Russia and China, which have continued to work on nuclear power developments, even as the US was held back due to a range of factors. For example, Oregon-based New Scale had to cancel its plans to build the first small modular reactor in the US when power utilities there objected to a price increase it was proposing to cover rising costs. TerraPower seems likely to push ahead though since it has secured funding and is not reliant on public markets. The fact that the new technology can't be used to produce weapons-grade nuclear material is also a significant feature, given that the countries which can make it work have more than half an eye on all the future markets that need boosts of always-on reliable energy, for instance Africa and parts of Asia. Meanwhile, other US firms are quietly seeing the potential closer to home. Amazon, for instance, recently acquired a nuclear-powered data centre in Pennsylvania. You may not know it, but this represents something of a shift. Mark Nelson, the Managing Director of Radiant Energy, told the FT, We lost a bunch of American nuclear plants in part because Amazon and others refused to accept nuclear was clean. Now, the big tech thinking on the topic seems to be evolving somewhat, so expect to hear more about this in the future. Probably not from Germany, though. The European Central Player, which famously closed its remaining nuclear power stations in the name of the environment, causing it to have to go back to coal generation instead, well, it seems unimpressed. A 650-page study was released this week, commissioned by the German government, looking at various types of new generation nuclear power plants and concluding that the new tech does not solve the problems that Germany's politicians believe that nuclear power has. So for now, it seems unlikely there will be any reversal of policy there, not so long as the current left-green coalition remains in government, at least. 
So that's one of the big hopes for the clean energy future to combat the impact of climate change. Meanwhile, one of the other stories on a related theme has come to a juddering halt this week. Because I also did a video some time ago about this, namely the plans by Harvard researchers to carry out an initial experimental release of material into the stratosphere to test the potential for geoengineering to reduce the impact of global warming. The principle is that in the short term, as the warming of the planet influences various knock-on impacts, such as the melting of glaciers and defrosting of permafrost, you could reduce that downward spiral by injecting aerosols into the upper atmosphere to reflect some of the incoming sunlight back out into space. This would mimic the effect that we've often seen following major volcanic eruptions. When a volcano has been a major enough event to send sulfates high enough to penetrate the stratosphere, where they will then spread across the globe and remain for a period of around 18 months or so, that has had a cooling effect. It's relatively short-lived, but a significant impact nonetheless. Hence, various researchers speculated that you could replicate this in order to buy yourself time for the longer-term changes. For the cooling to be extended, you'd have to repeat the operation every couple of years or so. Now, the thing is that while some researchers have been arguing for such a move, many others, and one should add rather a lot of non-researchers as well, have been expressing a degree of alarm about the idea. They worry that something could go wrong, that there could be major unintended consequences, and that those consequences could hit certain locations particularly hard. So, about six months ago, when the Harvard scientists were proposing to do their small-scale exploratory release to gather data about the movement of very limited amounts of material, it was, to say the least, highly controversial. They had proposed to launch a high-altitude balloon, which would release a few kilograms, an amount that would have zero impact whatsoever, into the atmosphere. But by flying through the plume, they would be able to measure how widely the particles had dispersed, how much sunlight they were reflecting, and various other things. This would provide real-world evidence that would enable or be part of a process of enabling greater confidence in doing geoengineering for real and avoiding the mistakes that some people fear. But regardless of all that, hugely controversial it was. They ended up postponing the flight in the face of widespread pushback. This week, the university released a statement saying that the Scopex project has been abandoned completely. What's the official explanation for that? Well, there isn't one per se, but the lead researcher replied to an inquiry from the MIT Technology Review that he had, quote, learned important lessons about governance and engagement throughout the course of this project. I detect a fair collection of polite euphemisms in that sentence. No doubt one day there will be a book that reveals all. Does that mean that nobody will push ahead with this? Well, part of a challenge of this area is that it's not that technically hard, nor that expensive to do it, which means the bar is quite low. Gerno Wagner, climate economist at Columbia Business School, laid out the dilemma like this. Responsible researchers deciding not to conduct this kind of research gives ample room for irresponsible actors with all sorts of crazy ideas. In fact, the announcement doesn't mean that Harvard will have nothing more to do with the field at all. It intends to continue studying geoengineering dynamics, just that it will do so purely in the lab from this point. Now, speaking of climate policies that create a certain amount of lively comment and debate, this week also saw the Biden administration unveiling its restrictions on vehicle emissions to push the change to electric cars in the United States. The goal is for more than half of the new vehicles sold to be electric by 2032, which is a pretty big increase from current levels. The administration calculates that achieving the shift would reduce CO2 emissions by 7 billion tonnes over the next 30 years. It is quite a radical move, but reined in from the original. 
It will be phased in more slowly than previously planned and will give the major automakers more choices in how to comply, which means they could improve their line to have a mix. More efficient gas engines alongside hybrids and electric vehicles. The original plan envisaged two-thirds of all the new vehicles being sold being electric within six years. Something of a stretch, particularly since consumers have been slower to embrace the new tech than they would have had to have been in order to make that speed of change remotely feasible. Last year, EVs made up just over 7.5% of new car sales in the US. The lack of adequate charging infrastructure is just one of the problems, discouraging quicker uptake, particularly for commercial fleets. Toyota is one of the firms standing to benefit most with the newly pushed back rules. It had decided not to rush headlong from its strengths in hybrids and plug-in hybrids, which positions them pretty well with the new regulations. Now, whether any of this survives the coming election is, of course, an open question. Trump has railed against EVs in his speeches, suggesting that they're all made in China, which maybe they will be if you decide not to support the technology in America. I mean, kind of how innovation and capitalism works. But that's a discussion for another time, perhaps. It was quite possibly a talking point when Trump recently reportedly had conversations with Elon Musk, following which Musk tweeted that he was not supporting either of the two presidential candidates with donations. His recent positioning would have, you would think, made him more temperamentally inclined to support Trump's bid for the White House than Biden's, but kind of hard to do that if you're the chief executive of Tesla and the candidate is clear how pushing back against your product is one of his big campaign messages. But we'll see how it all plays out. All right, that's all for this week. My thanks as always to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Without their support, I could not get the time to produce these videos. I have struggled over the last couple of weeks because things have been really busy. So there's only been one video per week. We will aim to do better next week. In any case, have a good week. See you next time.